Welcome to another edition of The Wheelhouse, cycling, easily digestible, mostly factual. My name's Joel Spreadborough, joined not by Kate Bates, who remains elusive, remains anonymous. Hello, Kate. Hello, Joel. I'm sorry I'm not there. I am missing you. It's, um, you know, it's pretty cold and bleak where I am, but I've got my, I'm away at the Commonwealth Games. And this is an Olympic mug, Joel, but I have a bit of a tradition where I always, you know, get a, a games mug. Yeah. Um, so I'm a little bit disappointed that the Commonwealth Games mascot is a bull. It uh, doesn't really do it for me. But, you know, I'll still uh, bring a mug home and everyone will be happy. That's awesome. And you know what you do? You warm to mascots. I, I, I reference beavers. I reference squirrels. <laughs> so I reckon the <laughs> bull... We'll win you over. And you know what, what I'm, what's good is there are fragments of you here in the Wheelhouse Studios back lot, wherever we are. Uh, a Parramatta jersey is here. I You're... noticed that, Jolly. Yeah. Are you missing me in there? That's my home club, Parramatta. And, I mean, you might notice there's not an eel to be seen on the jersey because the Parramatta Cycling Club aren't eels. But, um, you know, my home's stomping ground, so you can yeah. feel like I'm close there. I did scour jersey. it for an eel. Uh, no eel to be seen. You're, you're correct. <laughs> also, a, cu a cutout of, of you as well. So it's oh, like, oh, yeah, Kate's around. But also you're hovering over me and making sure I don't stuff this up, which, which is good, which is well, good. <laughs> and I've got something for you too, Joel. I've um, been commentating this week with Scott McGrory. And uh, Scott... He is also known as Scott Loves a Story McGrory. And uh, <laughs> so I've got this little device that just keeps him in line and I thought it might come in handy for you. Um, just a little bit of an egg timer here. Um, so if he talks too much and this runs out, well, it's all Game sorts over. of trouble. So I thought this could come in handy for you, Joel, yeah. just to tighten up. Tighten it up a little bit. So cut the waffle. You know, I love I've it. I've got this on my desk, so just watch out for and that. And it's on time. It's happening right now. It's a generous sand timer, egg timer, whatever you call it as well. Get a fair bit of waffle in there. Well, <laughs> on that note, uh, look, all good for Australia and everything at the Commonwealth. Let's just take a moment to highlight the wheelhouse and our first piece <laughs> of glory in the Six Nations tipping comp. Shout out to Mark Pryor here. Uh, Kate, what an inspired run that was. Yeah, we won ourselves a uh, a yellow jersey, Joel. I mean, I'm just I'm glowing with pride. I, I should have worn a yellow jersey just to celebrate it. No, um, they do have some fantastic tipping competitions on social media around all of the major events, uh, and they started a new one this year at the Tour de France and then the Tour de France Femme, and we entered a wheelhouse team, Joel, and uh, we came out on top. So what you do is you choose six different countries to make up a team. So you can't have any two riders from one nation. And then each day you have them for the entire tour. And then each day based on who finishes in the top 10, they kind of score it. It seems a little bit complicated. He's got a fantastic spreadsheet going. Um, all I can say, Joel, is we won. So it doesn't really matter how the spreadsheet works. Uh, our name ended up on top. Yes. Wheelhouse victory. Wheelhouse, Wheelhouse wheeling victory. its way to victory. But I have <laughs> I have one. I picked out one anomaly. So Anna Meek, obviously Glory. We'll get into that very soon. We tipped it here. You heard it here. Heard it here first. No one else expected her to do it. We tipped it a few weeks ago. But I gotta ask you, why didn't we tip her in the tipping comp? Well, because I thought that she'd win by being successful in the last two stages. And so I chose Mariana Voss to get all our points haul. And I think we did well. I mean, yeah. she's the goat, not literally the goat, but the greatest of all time. She won so many uh, jerseys stages along the way. So winner, winner, chicken dinner. Yeah. It's just a bit of a bummer, I think, because if your rider crashes out, you don't get to replace them. So I think we might uh, get onto Mark to tweak the results a bit because that's what brought us undone, Jolly, in the men's Tour de France one because we picked Roglic um, over – the podge and yeah 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 the terminator Just, it, it wasn't it wasn't a good call in the end so yeah yeah they, they yeah. run out of sticky tape for rog unfortunately to put him back together this year but look, look, next year we'll do it again uh very exciting times kate let's talk women's tour it was an extraordinary event now i just want to go through quickly if you don't mind it actually rated higher than the French Formula One GP in France. That's extraordinary. It was such an exciting race. It had everything. If you if you know I'm a, a, a very serious journalist, I've done a little bit of research here. I've got some numbers, if you don't mind. So if I'll just rattle these off. French numbers, 2.25 million viewers across two channels 
in France. Across the entire race, 20 million viewers. It peaked at 5.1 million. Now, I'm going to keep running with the numbers because I'm very mathsy, as you know. 45.6% audience share was watching Arnhemiek's overall crowning, which is extraordinary. Outside France, broadcast into seven European countries, 75 million hours. However that works, that is that is just insane. Eurosport reached 40, 14 million viewers, 22 million views of online videos, and in Australia, 23 people watched highlights of it on the Wheelhouse podcast. <laughs> I wondered where you're going with that one. I think you're a team accountant by the way you're crunching those numbers. But it's pretty remarkable, isn't it? And that 46.1% audience share on the final stage uh, for Annemiek van Vloten, uh, that was 1.5 million viewers tuning in to watch the women race. I mean, the next time somebody comes at us with the argument of, you know, there's no money to be made in female cycling, I don't know if they've just got a crap sales team or you know <laughs> don't put anything in the marketing budget but the numbers don't add up to me so I think that you know it could in many ways really reinvigorate a lot of sponsors and, and bring in a lot of people who wouldn't invest in the men's side of the sport it's great so, numbers I mean huge success yeah and so exciting and you're absolutely right what what a what a magnificent event let's talk about Annemiek van Vloten now so 39 years old. Uh, I don't want to get awkward here, but I, I, I'm going to ask: <laughs> is, is that old, Kate? To be? Oh, you are you are treading very carefully, here, aren't you? No, she is. I think a bit of a role model to female athletes in that regard. The biggest reason, in my understanding, and certainly everything I've seen, is the reason that female athletes tend not to still be in sport at 39 and excelling has a lot more to do with lifestyle factors. The fact that there's not a lot of money in pro women cycling historically. So they've had to um, transition to a career to, you know, pay bills, keep the electricity on all that jazz. And also, of course, if they want families in a sport where there's been no provision for maternity leave and there's been nothing like that, it's been very hard for women to have children and come back to the sport. So you've seen a lot of women in their early thirties, leave the sport because they don't want to have to sacrifice um, the family element mm. uh, for the sport. And so it's been a bit of a complicated mix. And then you enter into a new era where there is a bit more money, uh, where there is choice. So if the athletes do want to have a family and come back, like Lim Lizzie Armistead is a great example of that pregnant with her second child, won Paru Bay last year, 18 months uh, after coming back off maternity leave. So it can be done. And physiologically women are stronger at 39 than they are at 29 in endurance sports. So I think it'll become the norm a little bit more. But I did notice, uh, Joel, at Com Games, there's 15-year-old swimmers who are yeah. excelling. And it, it was quite bizarre to me. I was like, they're literally kids. Yeah. You know, they're so young. And it's such a different demographic to cycling. But there was also a 49-year-old guy in the uh, men's road time trial. And I felt like that was you know, this example to mammals all around the world, like you can still do it. So there's hope for you, Joel, is what I'm trying to say. Thank you. I was going to say I'm 36, yep. so 13 yep. years to get in, Nick. Okay, yeah, I can do that. Um, look, <laughs> a AVV, she saved the best to last. The question of how she is still good. She, she There was a slow start for her, questions around form and all of that kind of thing. Is there egg on faces? It, it, was it, was it a, <laughs> yes. like this was always going to happen situation or did she dig deeper than anyone sort of thought she was able to? No, I think there's a little bit of omelette on faces with a little bit of ham stuck and some tomato wedged in there too, a little bit of salt and pepper. It, she was always going to be the dominant favourite in the mountains because they're massive mountains and nobody climbs like Van Vloten. The only person that even really comes close tends to be Anna van der Breggen. She's just retired and Ashley Mormon Passio. And unfortunately, uh, she went down with a bug and wasn't able to finish uh, the last stage. So that was a bummer. I think what was extraordinary is how she did it. It wasn't an attack at the end and she rolled over the line. There wasn't this battle like we saw between Poggi, pardon me, and Vingago. It's just, she was just so dominant and they threw everything at her. So she wasn't dominant because they let her go and didn't chase. Mm. They did everything. Like the kitchen sink was getting hurled up the road at her. Mm. Calamity befell her. Nothing was going to stop Van Vloten. Yeah, beautifully said. And and what a feat to hurling a kitchen sink up a mountain it, to stop her. <laughs> you know, 
She stayed it's like on the, the bike. X Games. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit of a hybrid crossover. Look, she stayed on the bike. Not an easy thing to do. Unlike this motorbike rider and photographer who was unable to handle the 24% incline on the Super Le Ponche de Belfiel. How'd that go? Close. Oh, thank you. Uh, let's take a quick look. For those listening on, this is a <laughs> motorbike rider and a camera operator doing their level best. To, to stay in pursuit, uh, it didn't quite work out for them. Well, 24%. So you can see that on the bottom of screen, just how steep it is and laboring. Oh, and, oh. Oopsie. I love, you know what I love <laughs> I'm about sorry, it? I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh. It, I hope they weren't hurt. I believe they weren't, but. <laughs> you know, it's serious when the camera operator takes the camera away and stops pointing and shooting. So, cause that's the, the golden rule Where's of shooting. Where's the footage? Yeah. <laughs> It underscores this, the, the incredible feat of, of AVV once again. Now, she broke another record out there. It didn't get the attention of her overall win, but I, I wanted to ask you about this. Six bike changes in a 30-kilometre stretch. Now, is that some kind of world record? <laughs> yeah, I reckon that is. It's unusual, if we can say, un <laughs> if we can describe it that way. She got this beautiful new bike from uh, the Movistar team sponsor, Canyon, which is a beautiful bike manufacturer. And it was yellow and it was all over social media and everybody was putting love heart emojis um, around it, like a little bit jealous. But I'm not sure that it was tweaked quite to her liking or there was something going on. She got off the yellow bike. She got back on it. She changed bike. Yeah. Uh, it was quite remarkable. I think if you put Benny Hill over a montage of all of her bike changes, you could amuse yourself endlessly. Um, so if we could get Mercy onto that, that would be fantastic. Oh, you're giving some real pop culture uh, <laughs> insights today. We've gone from Bridget Jones to Benny Hill within two minutes there. That's awesome. Oh, you know, I, I'm working my magic, Joel. What can I say? <laughs> Look, one thing that did stick out when she was changing bikes her opponents weren't waiting round. Now, this is a, a question of ethics. I, I do love to ask you about this kind of thing. We've spoken about it during tour time in the past as well. What is up with attacking the yellow jersey in these kind of periods, Kate? Yeah, good question. I think you could probably debate heartily both sides of it. I don't know. I mean, it's etiquette, right? Just in the same way as at Wimbledon, you're supposed to wear white. Ask Nick Kyrgios what he thinks of that. It doesn't go down that well. Uh, <laughs> I like a bit of tradition and I love that cycling has a bit of gentlemanly aspect to it. I think that there is a line though, mm. and maybe you wait once for Anamique, but six times, like, come on, okay, she's already so leading the race. She's yeah, dominating. Sure. If they just sit around and wait for her to get mechanical after mechanical, I mean, it's not very sporting either. And it's probably um, not as so good I don't for think the product. It was a bad thing. Yeah, for the viewers, it's like the twenty-three people tuning into the wheelhouse watching highlights. Like, come on, get on with it, guys! Stop stopping. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I met one of our twenty-three viewers oh. uh, in the hallway at work the other day too. I, I nearly had to brace myself against the wall. Uh, but yes, I think you're right. It is an entertainment product, and there has to be manners. But I think there's a limit to that. So I don't think anybody did the wrong thing there. And anyway, she still won by a romping margin, so yeah. <laughs> it didn't affect her. Congratulations to her. Now, Ellen Van Dyke, moving on, Ellen Van Dyke has highlighted the splendor online of post-tour crits. Very warm, fuzzy, really lovely. And I, I just have one question about that, if you don't mind. Uh, Kate, what are post-tour crits? <laughs> well, uh, crits like criteriums. Um, I'll, I'll note that we could get very fancy with how to say crits. Um, it's pretty basic though. Oh, uh, and what they are, <laughs> essentially what they do after the Tour de France is they block off little towns. And when I say block off, I mean like put giant barricades the entire way around the town and then you have to pay to get in. And then they fill the town with beer tents pretty much and they pay all the Tour de France cyclists to come and put on a show for them and race. And our criterium is around, you know, a small circuit, just races through the town. But the funniest thing about them is they're all set up. So first they drive around, they drive them around in cars. It's a little bit old school, Joel. They've got the podium girls all dressed up to the nines with their big hair and big makeup. Okay. They whoosh them around town. Everybody cheers and claps and then they race. Uh, but they also have to wear their Tour de France jerseys. So they'll be wearing their yellow jersey or their green polka dots uh, or what have you. They get paid an enormous amount of money. And then they pretend to race, essentially. They've Before they even start, they've got a predetermined finish order. 
and everybody knows it, but it's still super entertaining. And maybe that's because there's so many beer tents yeah. <laughs> that by the time the finish happens, nobody's even really paying that much attention, but it's pretty cool. Like carnival atmosphere. And I love it. It's kind of like the, the, the WWE of cycling, the a staged <laughs> event. I, 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 okay. I can <laughs> see that working. Um, yep. now your favorite, not other than me, Peter Sagan, uh, he's dipping his cleats into the world of e-mountain biking. Getting on the trails, he never stops. What's it all about? It's pretty cool, actually. And, I mean, can you just add an E to the beginning of everything and make it sound funkier? Uh, <laughs> e-mountain bikes, they're really cool. And the thing to remember is they go so much faster, obviously, because you literally have a motor on the bike. But that changes the skills that are needed. And it makes mountain biking, which can be, it's entertaining to watch, but it's a bit of a hard slog as well. Sometimes a little bit more dynamic because you've got a bit more speed going and uh, then they have to negotiate some of these obstacles going much faster. It's kind of like a mix of cross country and downhill in that regard. And Peter Sagan started his career on a mountain bike and look, my theory, and I tell you what, Merxy might like lunge through the production suite uh, when I say this, is that Peter Sagan's at the end of his useful life on the road and I say that with all due respect but he's an older athlete and he hasn't won nearly as many races in the last three to four years that he did prior to that but he's a huge name and he's a huge personality and I think Specialized have had a conversation with him and said we still want to pay you the big bucks but why don't we get you across all of these different things because you're so marketable and people want to see you and have you out there but it's no longer just about having you at the Tour de France or such events. And I think that's what it's about, allowing him to have fun and give his personality out and really engage with the fans and it not be all about winning. So I don't expect him to win. I mean, he, whether he wins or finishes 10th or 20th, I don't actually think there'll be much difference to specialised and to the investment. I, I think just him getting out there will probably sell a whole heap of e-mountain bikes. I know you're a mountain biker yourself, Joel. Yes. Um, how would you go with a electronic bike, a, a battery, a bit of battery power? You oh, recommended uh, help? Outstanding. I, I e-biked in here this morning. I, it's, <laughs> yes. No, look, I, I'm a big admirer. I think it's actually, it's, it's for, from the sports point of view as well, diversifying like this and using big names like Sagan, uh, uh, it's 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 a good move. It's smart. It's 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 new audiences. It's new frontiers. All of that kind of thing as well. When I first saw it, I'll admit I thought, "What? He's playing video games with bikes in?" But no, it's not that. It's actually quite exciting. So good luck to him. Yeah, and he rode the Rio Olympics, and that was the first time I ever commentated mountain bike. That was quite a learning experience on the go. But um, what I noticed was he got a lot of flat tires because. He had the horsepower in his legs, but he hadn't been on a mountain bike for a while. And so he kept hitting surfaces really hard and getting pinch flats and it just kept happening to him. And so I'm really interested with a motor in the bike and mm. even speedier, uh, how those skills go, but, uh, watch and wait. I'm sure we'll get some good social content out of that. Let's go to the com games. I, I don't want to go to where you are. Cause I know so, it's top secret and anonymous and elusive, <laughs> but we'll stay on the mountain bike now an Aussie. It's the feet stuck out to me, but the nickname, what an extraordinary nickname, has claimed silver on debut in the women's cross country. 21 years old. Zoe Cuthbert. What a legend. Well, now this uh, nickname that you're talking about is the flying raccoon. Yeah. I wanted you it's to give it nickname. out because you just do the animals so well. And <laughs> Well, look, last night I thought that. Davy Crockett wore a squirrel on his head. So I think I my animal that. identification skills are lacking. Let's just yeah. say that. But when I heard that she was called the flying raccoon, quite beside the fact that she made history winning a silver medal at the Commonwealth Games. So yay for her. We'll say that uh, up front. But moving on to the flying raccoon part, I was like, where on earth did she get that nickname? Yeah. And her mother said she made it up. Like nobody is sure where it came from comes from she thinks she just thought raccoons were cute and she thought she was going fast and all okay. of a sudden she's the flying raccoon is so, it ponytail like whipping in the breeze sort of fashion any of that no kind of, like, any kind no, of raccoon? In, no no in fact she wears pigtails a lot of the time okay. like double plaits i'm just trying so, to think if i've ever seen a pigtailed raccoon i don't think i have okay <laughs> maybe a beaver or a squirrel i don't know <laughs> let's go to the velodrome now a gold rush for straya but also, at a, at a bit of an emotional roller coaster in Lee Valley, Kate, you covered it all for Channel 7, of course. Whew, up and down times. 
Oof, I tell you what, I don't know if uh, we just need a giant jug of chamomile tea or uh, something like that, but it was a little bit of an emotional roller coaster. There were lots of moments that really stood out to me, but, you know, I think that I had the absolute pleasure of being able to commentate the women's points race amongst all the other events. And that's a very special one to me. And to have an Australian winner, uh, Georgia Baker, that was a real moment for me, I, a bit of a goose bumper. You were you said that with such humility. I'm going to to do this to you now. Georgia Baker, uh, a statue in Tasmania, is in discussion. She was brilliant, yes. but you are a former gold medalist in the very same event. And if I may, the only person to win it twice. You got to call it. Talk about goosebumps. What a special moment. What was going through your head? Were you, were you was it bittersweet? Were you emotional? What what happened? Yeah, it. it I I have to say that when the points race comes on, especially the women's points race, it, it's almost winning an event like that takes you through generations. And I mean that by watching it, I felt a lot of the same emotions. My body remembered what it was like to be in that velodrome and, and racing. And I thought about um, my friends on the sidelines. And I thought about the, the first photo I ever had at the Commonwealth games with my mum and dad. And it's the most beautiful, innocent photo. Like my dad just looks so proud as punch. And I hadn't put a single pedal stroke out on the track at all. Um, but it was a real family experience because I think when you get to one of those events for the first time, it, you realize how much everybody has put into that effort. And, uh, as you know, Joel, I lost my father not too long ago. And so there was a, definitely a part watching it. And my mum said it as well, that he would have loved it. He would have just been so proud of Georgia uh, and watching her race. And he would have really loved that. Um, sorry, I'm getting a little bit oh, choked course, up, Joel, no. but um, because Georgia also was very much riding for her father. So she lost her father back in 2015, Patrick, mm. and uh, he was her training partner and he was very much her inspiration to be on a bike. And ever since um, she had to say goodbye to him, she has said that she's raced with him in her heart and every pedal stroke has meant um, a lot more thinking about him. And so I think for her to achieve something on her own was enormous. And I say on her own because very often she's part of a team. So she's had a lot of international results uh, in teams pursuits and Madison's, but very rarely as an individual rider. And that's a pretty special moment for her. That is so beautifully said, Kate, and, and such a special moment, as you say, doing her dad proud in the memory of him. And, and as you of course did as well. And thank you so much for sharing that insight. It's, it's, it's beautiful, beautiful stuff. Another great Tasmanian. She's up there with Arnie Titmus as the two of the great Tasmanians to come out of the Com Games. Now, <laughs> yeah. uh, I think Queensland is claiming. I know. Uh, Arnie Tit I Tit it's now, very but... controversial. Yeah, Tasmania's going. <laughs> <laughs> what? Hang on a second. Oh. <laughs> now, on last week's show, just saying, you had a bit to say about Nicholas Paul, uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago have won. Um, some medals in the past, but back in the sixties, I think 68 was when Roger Gibbon uh, won the last gold medal for Trinidad and Tobago. It's not a strong cycling nation traditionally, but the international cycling union put their support behind a number of um, Trinidad and Tobago riders and developed them at the world cycling center, which is in Switzerland, gave them scholarships, tutelage, coaching. And so to see that talent develop, where really the only thing stopping them from getting these results was opportunity because the minute they were given the opportunity, he's now the fastest man in the world. And in fact, I think that give him another, you know, 24 months, he could win three gold medals mm. because he is on that trajectory, but he's still learning the race craft a bit and he's still young. So he's still getting a bit fatigued as they go through the rounds, but he's a sensational rider. And I think it was really good for the Aussies especially on night one to be pushed uh, to him taking the gold over them because then it did a few backflips. The men's sprint competition, Joel, mm. talk about needing chamomile tea or oh, maybe yeah. something stronger. Honestly, it, it was just a crazy competition. There were crashes, there were relegations. It seemed to me like the judges or the commissaires, as we like to have really fancy names in cycling, if you haven't noticed. Um, so the commissaire, uh, they just like they had their cranky pants on a week, Joel. They were being so hard, the calls they were making. Uh, and it was really, yeah, it was, it was a little bit hard to digest in some moments. And in fact, it cost Matty Glates a bronze medal. Yeah, relegation. Him, Matt Richardson walking away with a fine. 
cranky pants comma says, I think now, if, if, if I may quickly, you were doing a great job in commentary as you do, but some of the descriptions being dished out and your penchant for nicknames, Captain Crunch <laughs> <laughs> yes. and the Flying Mullet. Now, I just want to quickly point out that there's controversy here because Rowan Browning is currently the fastest man on the continent of Australia. He also has a mullet and the nickname, the Flying Mullet. So what was going on with your nicknaming? Yeah, look, I think that I have some animal identification and some copyright issues, as it may be, when it comes to these things. <laughs> I mean, it's fairly self-descriptive though, right? Tom Cornish has just the most incredible mullet. It's not just, you know, business up front party down the back. It's like a rave down the back, you know, like that's like a <laughs> festival, a, a, a whole festival going on at the back of his head. And as for Matty Glatzer and Captain Crunch, I just reckon he belongs on the side of a cereal box. Like he almost looks like Mr. Incredible. He's got this great stature and this perfect hair and how his hair is so perfect when he takes a helmet off is absolutely beyond me, but he just looks the picture of composure, uh, even when he's just worked his butt off. And so I think the podium photos were really quite amusing to me. Nicknaming expertise. Uh, and, and it comes from good days. I, 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 I thought you all your love of nicknames. I looked you up. And uh, guess what? Wikipedia has your nicknames listed. Guess what your nicknames are on Wikipedia? Oh. Kate oh. or Katie. <laughs> so you can see where the creative uh, zest comes yes. from. I've got one yes. for you. Uh, I was either going to call you Chocky Oil because of your days uh, getting massaged <laughs> with the uh, T-Mobile team or KG yeah. Bates, the smiling assassin. That's the other Ooh. one I'm workshopping. I like that. I think I like that more than Chocky Oil, actually. Okay. Chocky Oil just, yeah. <laughs> Sends me back to some awkward memories there. Triggering, <laughs> triggering. Now, speaking yeah. of awkward, awful memories, I don't want to leave the velodrome with a terrible taste in our mouths, but unfortunately, some horrific crashes at the games. Good to know that everyone is okay. Everyone walked away all right. But honestly, let's uh, for everyone listening in, we'll take a look at it now. Uh, some of the carnage. Have you ever seen anything like it? I have not seen anything to this magnitude. So what happened was Matt Walls, the Olympic Omnium champion, has been pushed up the velodrome in the chat. And if you are listening, please go to our socials and check out these photos because it's quite remarkable. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, the Aussie Graham Frizzy also went down, but Matt Walls flies over the fence, quite literally flies over the fence, him and his bike. Uh, they're traveling around 70 kilometers an hour. It was really confronting. We can only chat about it and show it, Joel, because everybody remarkably is fine. Yeah. Like out of, not even broken bones. And it, it blows my mind because at the time we thought it was very, very serious. Uh, we understood that spectators were involved and children and we were very yep. scared for that. Thankfully, just some cuts and bruises for the kids. Um, I'm not sure they'll sit front row at a velodrome again, but I would definitely, it's not a matter of safety because I would, sit my kids in the front row of a velodrome. It's a freak accident. Yep. It was de very difficult to watch. And I think everybody was just shocked and mortified. The fact that they walk away, these guys are superheroes. I mean, he looks like a superhero kind of flying up through the air, but somebody was on his side. I'll say that yep. the universe uh, wanted a good outcome for him. And um, yeah, thankfully all of all out of hospital by that night back on social media, that's usually a litmus test of how somebody's doing. If they're tweeting within 12 hours of an accident, yep. you can be comfortable that it's not too bad. Quick to post. Uh, as you say, distressing scenes, Maddie Wall, there's one of those stills. There's a little girl sitting in the front row with a look of abject terror on her face. Uh, not what they, not what they expected, but good to see everyone was okay. Some people like knocked out cold on the track, distressing images oh. to see, but good to see they got through it and, and extraordinary times in the velodrome. There's, there, moving on, there's only one cycling event left, of course, the road race, but uh, overnight an Aussie romp in the time trial, uh, Grace Brown and Rowan Dennis doing the business, Kate. They rode tremendously. It, to start with the women and Grace Brown, she's planned her entire season around the Commonwealth Games and then next up the Wollongong World Championship. So not only did she smash it in last night, but it gives me a lot of confidence uh, heading into the end of September that she could have a really good World Championships. She came back to Australia a couple of weeks ago to take a break to see her family and her husband because she's away for the full year, headed back to Europe and then rode the Women's Tour de France. And it was so tough for her. She had some fantastic quotes uh, on social media actually that racing up those mountains wanted to make her crawl into a cave and crawl up and die pretty much wow, like wow. so tough okay. 
And she did say in her post-race interview that she was quite tired and she was a little bit worried how, whether she'd recovered enough from the Tour de France fam or whether she'd have a bit of fatigue going into there, but she was just so good, so dominant. And it was almost Grayson and the best of the rest. And then in the men's side, Rowan Dennis was sensational. Uh, Joel, I'm, I know that you saw a little bit of the action as well. And well, they were kind of going down left, right and center. There were quite mm, a few mm. falls on a really technical course uh, and Rowan, it just worked everything came together perfectly. And, you know, I'm proud of him. Like he, he's very fastidious with his equipment and the way that he's approached to everything. He's had some real calamities and I'm just relieved that he had no calamities yesterday and, and got that gold medal. So Another goal. Good on him. Yep. Aussie Go gold Aussies. rush at, in Birmingham. Uh, now just quickly, we're going to look ahead to Wollongong. You must be so upset. I'm sorry to do this to you, but your man, Wout Van Aert, isn't going to be time trialing. Wout is out, Kate. <laughs> Wout is out. Woot is oot. Oh, he's not Canadian. But for a Canadian, it would be Woot is oot. Yep, yep. Um, and I think Davy Crockett's a Canadian, to bring it full circle. Oh, good. I'll have to look that one up. <laughs> it's a real bummer that he's out. But the good part is that all his focus is on the road race, so he will still be making it down under um, to Wollongong. I'm also working on the coverage, Joel, and I just have this quiet little hope that he might get a result and come up on the panel and we get to interview him. See, it could it could work out. It could so work out. We might even I'll get him on the wheelhouse. I'll just throw that out there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. that would be sensational. I yeah. mean, I'd let you talk a little bit, Joel, but... Yeah, yeah. I love yeah. how your first thought wasn't the wheelhouse then. That was a good insight. Um, the absence could <laughs> set the scene a little bit for Tom uh, Dumoulin as well. It could. Now, he's retiring at the end of the season and he's just a tremendous personality in the sport, but he said he wants a little bit more um, work-life balance as it may be, that he hasn't been feeling all the feels in cycling for a little while and it's time for him to move on. For him to go out um, wearing a rainbow would be pretty good. And I think Van Aert being out, Rowan Dennis would probably remain and Filippo Ganna, the Italian, the biggest challenges to him. But my eyes are very quickly turning to Wollongong and the, and the road leading in there, because I think especially for the Aussies and the Aussie fans, having a home world championship is, you know, rare in any career or um, a fan's lifetime. So that's where the focus is going for me. So last night's time trial was a good little warm up. Let's just say that. Finally, before we go, Kate, this week, drama and glory for your mate, Logan from Logan. Um, Logan Martin, I refer to first question, what happened? Second question, when is he coming on the show? <laughs> well, I still, I never caught him through the airport, Joel, but uh, now that he's been in the States and he's transiting back to Logan, I might be able to, you know, go and camp stalk him the at the airport. airport. And try yeah. And find him. yeah. Now he won the X Games. So that was a pretty impressive ride for him because coming into his final run, he was sitting in seventh. Uh, he'd been robbed overnight, I believe. He'd had his uh, wallet and passport stolen and things weren't going too well for him. Um, and he just came out of nowhere and blew everybody away. And his competitors, they knew. I think the, the looks on their faces when he was out doing his run were all a bit like, dang, he's really pulling that together. So we're a bit proud of our boy, Logan from Logan. Um, and I'm working on getting him on the show, Joel. Although considering you live literally around the corner from him, yeah, I don't know, perhaps... You could put it. Yeah, in yeah. No, well, I'm going to take the mountain bike there and do some jumps with him, and and we'll bond over aerials. Uh, that's the plan. Kate <laughs> Sounds Bates. fully sick. Or Thank you. Like <laughs> <laughs> fully sick. Uh, Kate Bates, <laughs> take care of yourself. We'll we'll see you again soon, hopefully for episode five, uh, if you're around. But otherwise, enjoy your anonymous location. Rug up. Uh, it's always such a pleasure to chat cycling with you. Thank you, Joel. Oh, we'll be back in real life uh, to wear that Parramatta jersey for real. And uh, the good news is you didn't expend the egg timer. Oh, good. So Thank you. You're I'm allowed so back good. for another week. I have one more week, a stay of execution for me. This is the Wheelhouse podcast, mostly factual, easily digestible. My name's Joel Spreadborough. Kate Bates is here as well. We'll see you again next time.